This is the PR Podcast, a show about how public relations helps you tell your story to the world. We talk with great PR practitioners who have the skills, creativity, and just plain savvy to get their clients noticed. Now here's your host, Jody Fisher. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the PR Podcast. I'm Jody Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Well, do not forget, boy, I'm starting to sound like I'm wagging my finger at you guys, to send us your PR Podcast plug. This is a surefire way to get yourself some publicity, at least all the publicity that we can give you here on the PR Podcast. But uh, a PR Podcast plug uh, is something that you've done that you're proud of that you want to share with the community that listens to the show. And we've got hundreds of listeners around the world. And our, today's guests will prove that out um, around the world who listen to this show. We want to let people know what you're doing. Now, like we say, this is not about your nine to five. Um, it could be about a great press hit you you got, but what we'd rather hear about is your cool TikTok channel, um, your your YouTube cooking channel, um, your guitar talent, the book that you just published. Uh, we have a couple of former guests that have written books, um, you know, or won awards, all that kind of cool stuff that we do that, you know, we don't necessarily promote ourselves for other than maybe our social media. Send, we want to promote you here. So send a message, either an email to me, Jody at JodyFisherPR.com, or hit me up on any of the socials or on any of the PR podcast socials. Let us know something cool that you've done, and we will get you a PR podcast plug at the top of an upcoming show. Now on with our show for today, and we have got another great guest. <laughs> Helen Neal stands out as a fresh voice in sustainability communications through her work as the founder of multi-award winning HN Communications, where she champions the integration of sustainability into global business strategies. In 2023, HN Communications was recognized as the best B2B consultancy at the UK Agency Awards and as the best small consultancy at the PRCA DARE Awards. Helen's entrepreneurial spirit and impactful work in sustainability have also earned her a spot in F Entrepreneur's Top 100, her dedication to promoting kind capitalism, I want to get into that phrase, advocacy for more female leaders in business, and encouragement of global organizations to speak openly about their success and failures on the road to net zero, make her an inspiring original voice worth featuring on any platform. Helen, welcome to the PR Podcast. Thank you, Jodie. Thank you so much for having me. And, and hello from London, and uh, it's a nice kind of gray rainy typical evening here so really good to chat to you i'm excited to to chat more we appreciate you kicking off your evening with us um and and you hit a bunch of great buzzwords in there that i'm really interested in let's start out by talking about sustainability communications what for those who don't know what is sustainability communications and how do you practice it thanks jenny well i guess from my part, sustainability communications is different to traditional PR. So I actually don't come from a PR background. I don't come from marketing. My background is actually in the kind of political world, in the campaigns world. And um, when we set up the business, you know, a lot of our background was in sustainability. But in terms of the communication side of things, we always, when we work with clients and we work with both NGOs and global corporates on, on both sides, but when we work with those organizations, we always talk about sustainability as a mechanism in which to talk about the work that an organization is actually doing. So not a commitment, but actually doing. So the physical art of what they are doing around sustainability. Um, and also to talk around sustainability as a message of um, learning, of uh, education and collaboration. It is not a mechanism in which to sell your product or service. It should not be that. And uh, there are many reasons why it shouldn't be that, which we can touch upon in a moment. But I think there is a really strong delineation between traditional corporate PR communications and how we should be successfully talking about sustainability. It is different. That's a great uh, way to start out this conversation. And so not to put you on the spot, but can you give us like a, for instance, of a client, you don't have to drop a name, but a client that you've worked with and the, the thing that they've done that defines that sustainability communications? Yeah, sure. So we we work a lot, as I say, with with big global clients that you, you would probably recognize. Um, and 
I think where it has always worked really well is in, in a couple of ways. Firstly, it's about having a C-suite who are fully bought into this. This isn't a tick box exercise. This is about an organization that has put sustainability at the heart of its business and it, it transcends everything within its strategy. So that's point number one. I think then from that, um, being able to ensure that you've got a clear roadmap for what you are trying to do around sustainability. So we see lots around getting to um, carbon carbon neutral by 2050. We see a lot of these targets that have been set by the UN and the SDG goals and all of this great stuff, but it's important to set your business's goals. And I think where I've seen it work well is business have a clear roadmap to get there. But what they also do is they're willing to say, we don't have all the answers. We don't know exactly how we are going to get there, but we've got some targets and we are doing something in all of these areas to move the dial forward and share the doing. I think, um, you know, where they have made rather than just share commitments, it's about sharing the actions and activities that are going on and are happening. It's about sharing the learning from those. And let's be honest, transition to more sustainable practices can be complex, difficult. They can be costly. Um, but to do nothing is really not going to be sustainable for you as a business in the long term. Business does have to change, right? So um, I think it's about being honest that it's difficult, but show that you are doing something to move forward. Um, but it is also about being careful about how you communicate that sustainability messaging um, and you don't do it as a mechanism in which to sell. And I think a key reason why you don't do it as a, as a, as a reason to sell is that we have seen many businesses get stuck within a potential greenwashing scandal. And we've seen it, you know, we've seen it in, in different places. And I think the reason why they come unstuck, not always are they trying to hoodwink the consumer or get one over on them some are but I don't think the majority are I think the majority want to do the right thing but I think where they get unstuck is they make a claim or they make a um perhaps they put a nice label a sustainability label on their their products but perhaps they haven't done all of the due diligence behind that you know have they got it third party verified have they checked that if they've got a label on their their product to say that it was generated through renewable electricity, what about the packaging? What about the recyclability of that packaging? All of these things have to be considered, otherwise it easily unravels. So I think it's very important. We have this phrase, you know, get your ducks in a row, but I think it is really important when it comes to sustainability that there's a process and a much more careful um, process that you need to follow because it's important. I, I, I feel like the, the Gen Xer in me is boiling up and, and agreeing <laughs> with what you're saying. In that, you know, we don't want to hear promises, right? We want to hear about actions and we actually want to hear about goals that have been achieved, right? Yeah, don't right. tell us you're going to do something. Tell us what you've already done and yeah. show us the receipts on what you've already done. Is that where you're driving your clients? 100%. And not only show us the receipts, make sure that someone else has checked those receipts as well to say they're okay. Yeah, that's a great point. The old third party endorsement, right? You can yeah. pat yourself on the back all you want. That's called advertising. When yeah. someone else pats you on the back, that's called media relations and, and third party endorsement, right? Exactly. Great point. Exactly. Great point. And I think that's where um, some of the work that we do as well with the NGO world is so important. And I think certainly we see a greater collaboration with, with some much more forward thinking corporates are starting to realize the value of the kind of NGO world to support them on their journey more than they have done before. And so what are some of the, again, you don't have to drop client names, but what are the, some of the types of projects that you're working on with clients and, and how are people flexing their muscle in the sustainability communications arena? So I think, I think it, so let's take one example with one, with one client that we work with around brand mapping. So one of the things around sustainability is, you know, how do you as an organization credibly talk about sustainable practices and have a sustainable purpose as your business? Let's take, for example, a games producer, you know, an online games producer. 
But if they're trying to do something sustainably or want to communicate on something sustainably, but what they're doing is they're communicating on the fact that they're planting trees. Where's the connection between that business and that brand and what they're doing and the fact that they're planting trees? There's no connection. So the consumer and, and all of us would think, well, hang on a minute, you're just kind of doing this to tick a box. It doesn't quite make sense. Where we've seen it really work, and I think where this brand mapping piece comes in, which might be interesting for your listeners, is about looking at what your brand is and what it stands for. And there's a, I'll, I'll pick a, an example. There's a Romanian beer company, stick with me here, a Romanian beer company. Uh, on, the, on their product is a bison. Uh, and in Romania, the bison is um, deeply endangered and its habitat is being destroyed. This beer company decided to um, work with WWF and have a whole campaign around saving that habitat because they have the bison on their product. Exactly. You can see how these two things fit really nicely together. And it's been a huge success because the people in Romania, they get this, they know this is an issue, they understand the brand and they understand why the brand is doing it. And suddenly there makes it makes a complete sense as to why this organization is doing what it's doing. So it's about finding that mechanism, that goal, that additional piece beyond all the stuff that you should be doing, you know, with 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 getting to kind of net zero. But how else can you engage your consumer from a PR perspective? It's about looking at your brand and how you map it to a purpose that links directly to your your organization. That is crystal clear. And people probably feel great about picking up a can of that beer because they probably their little voice in their head goes, oh, I'm saving the bison. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that and that's the reaction you want. Right. That's that's what a clear brand mapping strategy does is it, it makes that instant connection. Yeah, exactly. Great exactly. point. Great point. Let's go on to something else that we talked about uh, uh, that we talked about in your in your intro here that fascinates me. I want to hear about the phrase kind capitalism. It appeals to me, but uh, I'm making an assumption there. So tell me what that is and how you use it. So for, for us, you know, kind capitalism is all about a business being a force for good in the world. So having more of a, um, you know, profit, let's be honest, profit is a good thing. We need profit as businesses to operate, to function and to do all the good things that we want to do as an organization. But it shouldn't just stop it there. There are, it's about having additional things that you do as an organization that is, you're being responsible to your um, your employees, you're in being responsible to your suppliers, to your customers, you're doing the right thing by people, but you're also doing the right thing by planet as well. So that means being mindful in terms of the, the resources that you use, how you use those, those resources and having those commitments to kind of move towards lower carbon consumption. So it's this mindful business about, and I really feel that, you know, we live in a world at the moment, which on some areas, and I don't know if it's the same in the US, but certainly in Europe, you know, capitalism is now a real dirty word. Um, it's not a good thing, you know, and it's it's it has a lot of suspicion around it. But actually, I guess I'm on a bit of a personal mission. You know, I see capitalism from a business sense as being a really positive thing, but it must be done in a responsible, kind way. So this is why I talk about that kind capitalism um, point, because I think you know, we as businesses, small or large, have a responsibility to do the right thing by people and planet and make a profit at the same time. It shouldn't just be profit. And I think we see, you know, consumers, Gen Z, and, you know, Gen Z are going to be, I think, something like over a quarter of our kind of consumer population by 2030. This is what they're asking for. This is what they want. And so I think this is this is about us as businesses responding to that. Yeah. I, and again, going back to the whole Gen X thing, uh, I think Gen X wants that too. You know, I mean, we, we yeah. want people to put their money where their mouth is and, and we're, we're tired of empty promises, broken promises, you know, uh, uh, lofty goals without, like I said, without any receipts. Uh, and so it's great to hear that you're working in an arena, which is kind of, uh, I'm going to use the word forcing, but maybe that's not it, but I guess forcing people to look in the mirror and really get down to brass tacks about the actions that they're taking. Um, because as you and I both agreed before we started the call, um, you know, press doesn't create itself. Press mm -hmm. follows action, whether it's good or whether it's bad. 
um, that's what's that's what gets reported on is things that people are doing. So I, I would I gather that you're you're kind of forcing or encouraging or inspiring your clients into taking those actions that you can then follow with with press coverage. Exactly. And I think part of that part of it is also about and this is the this is the more difficult piece, I will be honest, is about building that trust with the clients to almost also have a more have more humility more perhaps a little bit more honesty behind the curtain about saying this is a bit tough this is hard we're going to have to invest some money here um we don't have all the answers and traditionally particularly for big corporates that is not the way that they communicate you know this is a very different different sphere of of communicating and i wonder i do think you know I ask myself, is the media also ready for that too? Because I think it, there is a symbiotic relationship between the two to have this narrative, but it is so important that we have this narrative because um, no business is gonna get to net zero on their own. Uh, no industry will, we have to collaborate. And the best way in which we collaborate is by sharing the learning, sharing the difficulty, what works, what success look like, and being able to kind of share all of this, but we can't do that unless we have that open conversation. So I think we've got a little bit further to go, but one of the things we try to do with our clients, and I think we we help to move the dial, is getting them to a place where they feel more comfortable to be honest. And that takes some uh, uh, um, some vulnerability, right? I mean, mo most companies, I would imagine, and many that I've worked with, and perhaps you too, um, aren't really that comfortable pulling back the curtain on certain things. Um, and yet, I think, as you as you mentioned, that you know we're we're entering a war, we're in a world, and I think the demand for this is growing where people want to see behind that curtain. They're actually demanding to see behind that curtain because they want to understand if things are to get if things aren't getting better, why? And if things are to get better, we have to really pop the hood and see what's going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, for a lot of big companies who who we tend to work with, it's difficult. You know, a lot of these businesses have have shareholders and, you know, that that world is still kind of over here and we kind of need to we need to shift them so that we're getting a bit more comfortable with saying, you know, some of this stuff is difficult. We don't have all the answers, but we're, we're trying and we're really trying to do stuff here in this space and we want to have yeah. more conversations about how we do that. Yeah, I also think that some some companies and and I think all of us in general um, have to get a little more used to taking a small L in order to get a big W. Yeah, because I think we're way too caught up and going back to the I mean the, the the argument here about in the U.S. about you know it's basically capitalism versus socialism and you know given the polarization of our political sphere in the last you know five to ten years, yeah. um, you know everybody is the enemy. <laughs> and that's a world that is destined for failure I, when, I when everybody else is the enemy forget it yeah i couldn't agree more and this is why this spirit of collaboration this kind capitalism concept which is about you know looking at people planet and profit together um and and being more collaborative sharing the learning and like you say having a few small l's to get the big w that's the way that we we need to go and we need to get away from that either or and we must have and is there a way that people can start and, and i'm talking people i'm talking about us you know the pr yeah. people and communicate um is there a way that we can begin to communicate to the people who we work with who we represent um how to start to move towards that kind of capitalism are there ways that you talk to your clients about it I think it's I think it's about um firstly like that point I made earlier that that there is a kind of communication style I think for sustainability that is inherently different that has to be different for for businesses in terms of how they talk um it's not about selling a product it's about showing that you're moving towards a positive point and that you are trying and that point we made about actively doing so I think um I think that's the, uh, that's the first point. I think secondly, it's also about ensuring that internally within that organization that that C-suite are on board. And I think with those 
um, departments like marketing, for example, ensuring that the PR team, the marketing team and the sustainability team are there at the very start of that journey for a, for a campaign or an initiative so that everyone is on the same page and they act as a united force to come together to get the messaging right. I think that's a great way to end up our conversation here. Uh, and, and I thank you so much for your insights. Um, we are going to segue now into the rapid fire question portion of our podcast. If you've heard us before, Helen, you know what's on the way. Uh, we steal a page from inside the actor studio, ask our guests a series of rapid fire questions meant to elicit uh, a simple answer, maybe a laugh or two. I hope a laugh or two. Uh, and it's Friday night where you are, Helen. So it's time to kick off the weekend. Here we go. Rapid fire Let's question number one. What is your favorite news source? It's got to be BBC. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Brit, aren't I? So I guess it's got to be BBC. I got I got I got to diverge here for a minute. How has the BBC been reporting this whole Kate Middleton photo thing that's been going on? I oh. mean, I think they're always a little bit. Uh, I think they've they've gotten in to the palace is what I think, because they're always yeah. fairly sensitive towards it, whereas I see other media outlets be uh, a bit more brutal. Yeah, I got to tell you, I, I kind of gave the uh, good old American eye roll to that. I was like, <laughs> really? Whoa. OK, I, I just didn't understand why, if they knew they were putting out a doctored photo, why they even thought they could get away with it. That's I know. what I can't process. I know. What are you doing? It I hope she's OK. I really do. I don't know what's wrong. I hope she's OK. But just be honest, you know, just own it and be honest. If you can't make it, you can't be there. It's OK. We understand. Exactly. Exactly right. All right. Rapid fire question number two. What's your favorite social media platform? LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. I'm always on LinkedIn. I think it's great. And it's the kind. I know I'm obsessed with kindness, but it's the kind social media platform as well, which I love. This is a kindness friendly podcast. We practice kindness all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, rapid fire question number three, coffee or alcohol? Now, that's a very American written question. So you can substitute anything you like. Is I'm going to go with a very British answer. It's Builders Tea. Builders Tea. Builders, Builders Tea is, the brand. Is, is, is proper hardcore tea. So it's what your um, plumbers and your carpenters, when they come over and you offer them a cup of tea, it's a Builders Tea. It's very strong. Lots of tea bags, lots of milk, and it, it's a real oomph. So yeah, Builders Tea is for me. Okay. Can, can Is that exported from the UK? Is, can we, <laughs> I wish it was. That? It's like my biggest bug though. When I, when I travel and you just, it, the tea is just not the same. It's not the same. Oh, okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to send you one of those good old self-addressed stamped envelopes that we used to send out in the seventies. I'll send, I'll, I'll send you some builder's tea. We'll get some builder's tea. All right. Rapid fire question. Number four, what's your favorite on the run food? I think so. I don't like on the run food. I like to sit down and actually have a meal. So I struggle with this one. But if I had to choose, it would probably be sushi because it's, I, I think it's easy to eat, but it probably isn't. But it's easy to eat if you use it with your hands, which is totally uncouth, but that's what I do. Well, uh, then we don't mind uncouth, but I gotta <laughs> tell you, okay. So our, our guest last week um, was also from the UK and she answered this question. She, she said her favorite on the run food was a ramen cop. Okay. And she said she, she could not tell you how many times she's gotten in the back of a cab and got a weird look from the driver. Like, what are you doing with this cup of soup in the back of my cab? <laughs> I'm amazed they even, like, if it was a black cab in London, they wouldn't let her in, I don't think. Really? Okay. <laughs> all right, we'll stick to the sushi. Rapid fire question number five. Here's where we go all philosophical on you. What do you want to be after you finish this career? So after I want to, after I finish this career, once I've sold the business, maybe in the future, uh, I want to help female business leaders build their businesses. I would love to be a coach to help them build their business. So I want to go through the process myself and get all the way. And then I want to help other women kind of coming up and helping them build their business too. Sounds brilliant. I love it. And I hope you get there. Thank Helen, you. this has been a great conversation. Please let people know how they can find you online. They can find us online. We're on um, www.hncoms.co.uk. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Helen Neal. You should be able to find me there. And um, also as well, if you check out our website, we also have a little fun quiz. 
So if you are interested on how you're doing as an organization in terms of your sustainability, you can answer 12 questions and we'll give you some top tips on how to improve depending on your score. Oh, I love that little interactivity on the website. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Helen, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the show. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at The PR Podcast and send us a question or a comment. Our intro is by Christopher Apple. You can find him and his fantastic photography on Instagram at Christopher underscore A-P-P-O-L-D-T. Check him out there and hire him for all your photography needs. You can find me online at Jody Fisher on all the socials and on the web at JodyFisherPR.com. We'll see you next time on the PR Podcast. <laughs>